Hi, I'm Sal McCaglano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, former Merchant Mariner. I can't even go on. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On with the Colonial Pipeline, the Remain Calm edition. A little discouraged, people. I have to tell you, I am uh, got on air the other day. I've done these videos now on the Colonial Pipeline, and it's kind of hoping that making a difference. My little YouTube channel is getting out there to the masses, influencing things. And lo and behold, find out that that is not the truth. So this is, uh, I'm in North Carolina. Uh, this is the headline of one of our local news channels here. As more pumps run dry, NC officials plead with drivers not to gas up unless necessary. Uh, talked about the fact that you know, we, we don't have a gas shortage, we have a distribution shortage. And we have gas in the tanks and the depots and the fuel. And the one thing we shouldn't do is run to the gas station and start filling up every conceivable container you have. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, this is from uh, Patrick DeHan, the gas buddy guy. This came out just a few minutes ago. Gasoline outages by state percentage of all stations without gasoline. Alabama, seven, Washington, DC, 10%. The winner, number one. Number one, we're number one. North Carolina, 65%. Yes, that's us. That's North Carolina. Thank you, people. We're the ones who lost it over the gasoline shortage, which there isn't a gasoline shortage, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, I make a lot of fun of North Carolina. I'm not born and raised in North Carolina. I've been living in North Carolina since 1999. My wife is from North Carolina. I love this state. I love it it is home for me. It's home. It's where I, I, I want to be. It's where I want to raise my family. It's great. But I have to say some of our track records and things are, are not great. And if you don't believe me on that, just Google, Google North Carolina and snow. And this image is the one that will usually pop up in the top of the feed right there. We, we don't handle snow well. And obviously we don't handle a gas shortage well, but let me try to break this down a little bit and be a little more serious now and, and talk about what exactly is going on and, and, and why we should not be panicking and literally filling up every conceivable container we own with gasoline. I mean, the amount of images and videos I've seen of people filling things up that you should never put gasoline in is dangerous. Do not do this. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I really don't want to go to your car loaded with gasoline in milk bottles and Tupperware, uh, just don't do it, please. So anyway, let's go to this. This is the map of the Colonial Pipeline. So understand something about the pipeline. Yes, it is a pipe that goes a long distance. It's pretty long pipe, it really is. It's got a series of relay pumps all the way from Houston up to New Jersey, but it also has tank farms all along the way. And one of the things they don't do is basically pump a gallon of gasoline in Houston and you pull up alongside the terminal in Virginia and get that gas directly. It's coming from storage tanks. They have days of storage in these tanks. Matter of fact, about 21 days worth of storage is in here. In North Carolina, for example, Charlotte, uh, in Greensboro, we have these storage tanks, Lesser down in Selma. In South Carolina, there's two spots. In Georgia, there's two. In Alabama, there's one. In Virginia, there's one. Up in Maryland, there's several. There are storage tanks. Just because the pipeline turns off doesn't mean there's not fuel in the storage tanks. What people are doing right now by going to the gas, gas stations is depleting what's in the gas stations. They're emptying out the gas stations. And there's a finite number of tanker trucks that can go back to the depots, load up with fuel and come back out to the gas station. They have a schedule. They have a supply that's based on normal consumption. If consumption increases, it's going to force those trucks to turn around faster. Now, fortunately, they've given those truck drivers more time to drive. They upped it from 11 to 14 hours, but still you're going to deplete them a lot faster. And so it's important to understand that the pipeline is not a huge amount of, again, it, it, you talk about pumping, I think it's a range of about 2 million, uh, bar, uh, two, 2 million gallons per day through the pipeline. And also understand, there's another pipeline, there's the Kinder Morgan Plantation Pipeline. It's smaller, it's, it's about 750,000 gallons per day. It's in operation. Rail cars, there are 933,000 gallon tanker trucks, railway cars, sitting on sidelines around the United States, empty, empty. 
that can be loaded right now in Houston, Texas, put on rail lines for CSX and Norfolk Southern and brought into the southeast part of the United States. Understand the real, the real critical area is the southeastern part of the United States because we don't have refineries here. So we've got to get the final fuel here. There's refineries along the Delaware River, for example. There's refineries up in New York. So you can ship crude oil into those areas, refine it, and then distribute it from those areas. Same thing up in New England. But it's really here in the southern states, really from Mississippi up into Virginia, where you have the, the, the biggest issue here about it, with some ancillary pumping off to Florida and also Tennessee. And one of the things you're seeing now is diversion of tanker trucks from neighboring states into these states to increase the flow. If everybody runs at a normal level, the situation is not that bad. And I'll give you the example here. This is the report just came out today. The reason I didn't do a uh, video before now is I was waiting for this report came out. It Come, comes out 1 p.m. on Wednesdays. This is from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. They do this week in petroleum. I am sure everyone on this podcast and YouTube channel subscribes to this and, and can't wait for Wednesday at one o'clock to read their issue of this week in petroleum. Uh, fortunately, if you don't, I do because I'm a history professor and I do this kind of geeky stuff and I do it so you don't have to do it. And the new report just came out and I want to highlight some of the issues here in the report. Sorry, got to be able to read this. So let's take a look at this. So it, it usually what most people look at this for is the price of gas. So that's what they tend to kind of look for here all the time is, is price of gas. And obviously the big story here they're talking about is the, the, the colonial uh, pipeline shutdown. But this is really important. Uh, motor gasoline stocks in New England and the Central Atlantic region, PADs 1A and 1B, that's basically the eastern part of the United States, has a combined 40 million barrels of gasoline. That's 0.4% higher than the five-year average. So we are right at average where we need to be. Basically, we are exactly where we need to be. And if you look over here in this little chart down here, you'll see we're right there. We're right in the middle there, basically right in average of where we're supposed to be. So there, there wasn't a, a shortage to begin with. It's not like we were at a low level. We're at basically right where we've been for a five-year average. And again, the pipelines and the gasoline distributors do this. They don't want to be caught without gasoline. They know this. That there's, there's been outages of the pipelines before. There's been explosions because a pipeline's fractured. There's been shutdowns for weather. There, there's been actually some, some issues with cyber in the past. But th they have this kind of pre-planned in. So right here, you see that basically they're good to go at that level. Come down here a little more, Colonial Pipeline, 2.5 million per day, sorry, 2.5 million per day system, approximately 55,000 miles of pipeline. Significant mode of transportation is 45%. But again, 45% is significant. We're still getting 55% distribution from other means. So if everybody cuts down their driving just a little bit, you know, if we just, again, had some sort of, I, know, I hate to even use this word, but leadership from federal, state, and local levels, and had Colonial not been an absolute cluster in their messaging, I don't think we would have seen this. Or if everybody had watched and subscribed to my YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell to be alerted about new videos, and give it a thumbs up. They would not have panicked to the situation they have here. Uh, it goes on here and talks about it. One of the things they start to talk about, because no refineries between Alabama and the Mid-Atlantic produ produce substantial quantities of transportation fuel, the southeastern U.S. is 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 supplied primarily by the pipeline flow, but I just told you. Again, and if you look at here, you see where the pipeline is, the colonial pipeline, the, the plantation pi pipeline, that's the Kinder Morgan one. And then you have exports, and then you have marine shipments largely into Florida, and then imports here into New England and New York. Uh, it's actually cheaper to uh, import uh, some oil into that region that come from the North Sea area. They come from West Africa, where oil is ridiculously cheap right now because of the absolute cluster of a situation going on in Western Africa today that no one knows about. But that's that's why you get a lot of imports in the area. And some oil imports come out of the uh, United States uh, up into that area on those Jones Act vessels that we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, I found this statistic interesting because I've never seen this before. Pipeline shipments move at approximately five miles per hour, not fast. Uh, it's not a high pressure pipeline. Uh, most people don't know, know this, but water towers, uh, water towers and communities and everything like that, you don't 
fill a water tower from the bottom up. There's a little tiny pipe that goes up the side there and dumps water at the top, which is constantly flow flowing, constantly running. It's always filling up. So water towers will deplete during the day and during the night they fill back up. And the pipeline is much the same way. It, it, it's constantly flowing under a set pressure, always moving. But they open up different, one of the things you need the computer system to do is you can't open up every valve on the pipeline all at the same time. You have to control it. And so they're continually topping tanks in different areas. And used to, you would do that manually. Today, they do it by computer control so that, you know, hey, the tanks in, in Selma are getting low or the tanks in, in Charlotte are getting low. And they can basically do that with, and, and if needed to be, amplify the pressure. There's also a uh, pressure there's also substations along the way to 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 boost the pressure as it goes uh they talk about here markets along the atlantic coast with access to deep water ports savannah georgia charleston wilmington norfolk can receive limited imports from the global market and marine shipments via coastwise compliant shipping that is the jones act that is jones act shipping from the u.s gulf and that's an issue that's going on right now i want to talk about that here in a minute but i'm going to come back to that uh, talked about those federal waivers going on. The other thing I want to show you right here is this gets into the price of gasoline, uh, but I want to get over here and uh, show this right here. Here's the gasoline right here. So this is uh, actually a breakdown here specifically just in gasoline. And one of the things they show is the average price, but I want to come over here to stocks. Here we go. Gasoline stocks on hand. So gasoline stocks in hand are a little less than they were a year ago at this time, which is not surprising. Gas stocks were pretty high last year because of COVID. Not everybody was driving. Again, we're May of last year. There wasn't a lot of people moving around. So gas stocks tend to be higher. If you look right here, the East Coast is basically right around where it should be. Same thing with the Midwest. It's been pretty, and you have the averages going back here for about two months. And then you'll see right there. So you got a good supply on hand in the area. There's not a gas shortage. I, I can't emphasize this enough. There, there's not a gasoline shortage. It's a distribution issue. When everybody runs to the gas station at the same time and fills every last thing they have, they're going to deplete the gas station. And then the trucks are going to come when they're scheduled to come. And we see this in hurricanes. We see this in storms. We see this with power outages. And we're seeing the same thing right now. But I want to bring you down to this statistic right here. Days of supply. Number of days the United States has for gasoline. Last year, it was 40.1 days worth on hand. Today, 26.5. Last week, it was 26.4. We got 26 days. That's across the country for normal consumption. Around that's, that's almost a month. Almost a month worth of gasoline we have in there. And understand, refineries are up. They're running. Some refineries have shut down because they're not pumping into the pipeline right now. But pipeline, I mean, refineries are working. We haven't had an interdiction of the refineries. We have the colonial pipeline down, yes, but the plantation pipeline's up. We can haul gasoline by rail. We can haul gasoline by trucks. We can haul gasoline in a variety of different ways. What we shouldn't be doing is panicking right now and running to the gas station. And I mean, literally filling every container we have full of gas. Now, listen, I understand people in my area, you know, hey, I got guys who, who, who cut yards and they do landscaping. So they got a big gas supply. They got to keep up. They should be able to go gas as many containers and things you want. Uh, for the rest of us, get what you need. Don't go crazy. It's, you know, it, 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 there's not a reason to do that. The other issue they, they're talking about, and this is the one I want to talk about, this is maritime industry I talk about. So I, I guess I should talk about boats. So this story right here, uh, I'm going to run with the G Captain stories because there's, there's a couple of them here. So this is the most recent one came out. Uh, White House foreign shipping companies need to prove need for a Jones Act waiver. So I already talked about the Jones Act. These are those 57 tankers out of 180 vessels in the U.S. Merchant Marine that are U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. crewed, and U.S. owned. And therefore, they meet the requirements of what's called cabotage. They can move goods from one U.S. port to another U.S. port. Foreign ships move between U.S. ports all the time, but what they're typically doing is offloading. Come from across the ocean, offload in Charleston, head down to Savannah, offload in Savannah, head down to Jacksonville, offload in Jacksonville, and then they head back. They don't move goods from Charleston to Savannah to Jacksonville. They can load goods. They can load. They can load exports, but they just can't move them. And the reason for this goes back to colonial days, actually. Uh, the idea was... The U.S. wanted to make sure there was a domestic merchant marine so we weren't dependent on that old bad foreign merchant marine, the British. 
And we did, we reaffirmed this in 1817. We reaffirmed it in 1920 after the first world war, when US ship, when US goods were piling up in the dock because the British merchant marine abandoned us. The German merchant marine fled into our harbors to seek protection. And we were left only with our coastwise fleet to haul our goods from port to port. And we had to use some of the coastwise fleet to go into international shipping. And so we wrote this thing called the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 that not only ensured the protection of the coastwise fleet, but actually ensured we had ships on the international trade. It was actually a holistic maritime strategy. It was an amazing document. And I write and talk about that a lot. But one of the things we're seeing now is this, that foreign shipping companies will be able to, or may be able to, I shouldn't say will, can seek a waiver to come into a US port, probably Houston, or one of the Texas ports or Louisiana, load fuel and bring it to a US port. But to do that, they're going to have to show the need. In other words, there's no American ship available to do it in the time frame required, and there's an immediate need for it. So they're going to have to show that there is a need for this. Uh, this story builds on that, talks about the, the fact that the gas stations are running low. This is kind of what we just talked about and everything. This highlights it. And then I wrote a piece for, for G Captain the other day, May 10th, so two days ago, where I spell out more the issue about to waive or not to waive the Jones Act. And I make a very, again, I get charged for being a Jones Act flag wearer. You know, uh, you won't believe the names I'm called about this. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that the Jones Act and any piece of legislation is not perfect. They all need reform. There's nothing perfect out there. But in the case of this, this is the law. This is what the law is on the books. There are U.S. flag, U.S. companies that have vessels. They should be given the first opportunity to get their vessels out. Now, what's really, to me, frustrating about this is on Friday, the Colonial Pipeline got hit with the hack. They knew the amount of damage they were suffered. They knew how long it was going to take to get it back up. They should have informed, number one, the government of the scope of this. Second, the government should have taken measures right off the bat to inform U.S. shipping companies, hey, get your ships ready to go. If you've got any ships that are out of service, laid up, you know, not crewed up, start crewing them. We will cover the payment because this is a priority. It's an emergency. This is, this is the same thing with FEMA, the same way we stockpile water in times of a hurricane or fly in hospitals after tornadoes come rolling through. This is the same exact thing. There's an entity within the Department of Transportation called the Maritime Administration, which should have been proactive at doing this, except right now we don't have a full-time maritime administrator. We have an acting one. Uh, she's fine, but again, we need someone personal appointed by the president who has access to the Secretary of Transportation who can make these types of decisions. And what should have been done is on Saturday at the latest, companies that had tankers, OSG, Overseas Shipping Group, Crowley, hey, get your tankers crewed up, start getting crews on them. How long is it going to take for you guys to get online? And also, U.S. companies start looking overseas, what ships are available on the, on the spot market in case we have to use foreign ships. And, and that's, a, I think, a big thing, too. If we're going to allow these waivers to take place, let's not benefit companies that are not incorporated in the United States. Let's use U.S. companies to basically charter foreign ships. I think that should be done immediately. You know, because one of the things that's happening right now, and, and, and I'll make this point, you're going to load these tankers up. You're going to load these tankers in Houston, Texas, you know, down in the Gulf Coast. You're going to sail them to a port like Wilmington, North Carolina, right here. Understand, that doesn't solve the gasoline shortage in North Carolina. That gets a buttload of gas to Wilmington, North Carolina. It helps the people in Wilmington, North Carolina. But Wilmington, North Carolina is not designed to offload a massive tanker. There's not the fuel farm. There's not the tanks. So they're going to need tank trucks. They're going to need tankers. They're going to need all that distribution to get in. And should this go on for a prolonged period of time, this goes on beyond the 26 days, 21 days. I forgot the amount of days I said now. How many days I say? Uh, 26 days that we have available. Uh, you're going to be hauling fuel from the coast into the interior of the United States, over the mountains, into the mountains. That's a long haul. That's an extremely long haul. Are you going to be doing that from the coast? I think you'd be doing it from railways myself. But we need to be looking at all these issues. Plus, we may need a couple of tankers in some of these ports as floating storage facilities. We may need a tanker sitting there loaded with gasoline that we can pull from to put fuel ashore and fill up tankers. That, again, can be filled by American tankers or it could be leased foreign tankers if you're just going to sit there and let them anchor there and, and siphon off of them. 
And so we need to be thinking about a holistic strategy here. And more importantly, we need to be conveying this to the American people. Hey, here's the plan. This is what we're doing. There's no concern. Uh, this is, you know, hey, we, we've got truck drivers. We've got we've got uh, tanker trucks. We've got the railway industry mobilized. We've got the railways leaving right now, loaded to the gills with gasoline. We're going to pre-position them in places. We're going to top off the tanks at these places. We've got tanker trucks available. Hey, and we're getting ships. They're going to be at Savannah in Charleston, in Wilmington, in Norfolk, in Baltimore, ready to go. That's it. Alleviate the issue. Alleviate the, the concern. That takes care of it. And again, I, I think we need to be able to convey this. We need to be able to convey this in a very logical manner to everyone. And unfortunately, we don't seem to want to do that. Instead, we want to panic. And I go back to 65% of stations in North Carolina without gasoline. Uh, it, it's, 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 again, it's, it's, I'm not gonna lie, I topped my cars off earlier in the week, just because when I heard the story happen over the weekend, I did, I, I, you know, I went out, I made sure I had gasoline in my cars, that's it. You know, and I'm good, I'm good for a while now. I got you know, I'm good to go. I, I just, I don't drive that much. I don't have long commutes. And so I'm good. I don't need to be worried about and topping off every two seconds. And so one of the issues we're seeing is, is how this is playing out. I think that's important. Uh, I will say, and I will give credit to, to uh, people who I get accused of not giving credit to all the time. So Colin Gabrow over the Cato Institute writes prolifically against the Jones Act. He and I, if you want everyone to follow fun on Twitter, follow me and at Mercogliano S. And Colin and I will always get into it. And there's a cast of characters who are opposed to the Jones Act who just love to bash me and say things. And that's fine, whatever, whatever floats their boat. Uh, but Colin wrote this piece, the Jones Act should be waived, but more substantive changes are needed. You might as well record this and save this. Good thing it's going up on the internet. It'll never go away. I agree with Colin. We do need to make some changes. There needs to be some changes. He highlights several things that I will agree with. There are many things in here I will disagree with, but there are things in here I, I agree with. He talked about the fact that there's no uh, American ship to haul propane to Hawaii, for example. There's not. There's, there's not a propane carrier to, to do that. Hey, then, then if there's not a propane carrier in the United States and if the U.S. shipyards are not going to build one, then we should be able to reflag a foreign build into the U.S. fleet. And you know, with a set period of time, it'll operate, maybe put a surcharge on the export of propane in the, out of the United States, a few cents to help build up a, a supply of money that can be used to offset a shipbuilding program that will build an American ship in five, 10, 15 years. That's what we should be doing. I think there's a lot of things we can do to reform this. Uh, my concern is we open the coffer dams to foreign flag vessels, which don't get me wrong, foreign flag vessels are, there are great ones out there. There are, there are fantastic new build vessels out there. Uh, I have a problem with how foreign flags treat their crews in some of them. Uh, again, I, I did a video where I talked about that the, that the minimum wage for foreign flag seafarers is $21 and seven cents a day. That's a problem for me. I have an argument about that. And, and uh, you know, it's hard to compete with an American crew versus a foreign crew that's being paid that. Same thing with the, the massive subsidies that are given the shipyards in China, Japan, and Korea to build vessels uh, because they see that as a national security issue. And they also see it as a national economic issue, which we don't. We did, but we don't anymore. And so that's an issue. So I think it's very important to be able to look at both sides of an issue and be able to talk about it. So anyway, Sorry for being depressed at the beginning of the video. I, I feel much better now that I've talked to everybody. Hopefully this video gets out to a larger group and we can remain calm about this situation. It is not dire, it is not bad. Uh, the pipeline itself was not damaged. It was the software involved. We've got that confirmed from, from Colonial. So fortunately it was just the software that went down. Uh, they can do this the old fashioned way, turning valves and pipes. It's, 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 it's a little bit archaic, but they'll be able to start flowing some oil in some ways, they were actually able to flow some oil out of the Greensboro uh, facility uh, down to Selma, for example. I will say there is one critical issue. If there's a critical issue in this, I will give you this one. Along this pipeline are seven airports that receive directly gasoline from the pipeline, from Atlanta to Charlotte to RDU, uh, up to uh, BWI, Dulles. They receive gasoline, there's seven of them received directly. They do not have large storage capacities. They have capacity for probably about seven days worth of jet fuel. Jet fuel breaks down very quickly. So you don't really keep long number, you don't keep jet fuel around a long time. Uh, if the pipeline is not up 
in the week, you know, by the end of next week, you're already seeing some airlines diverting aircraft, having to send them other places to refuel. That's going to be an impact. Uh, that that will be an issue going forward. But again, we may be able to offset that by some railways bringing in jet fuel up to the airports there. That is, that is an issue. And, and that's probably the one concern that I really haven't heard talked about too much. But that's one of the things that the plant, uh, the, excuse me, that the Colonial Pipeline does. So, you know, if Atlanta runs out of gas for its airports, that's a huge major hub. Same thing with Charlotte. If Charlotte runs out of gas, that's a huge major hub. If you can't fly in the DC, it's not a bad thing, actually. It's probably good. Don't, don't go to DC. Uh, but the other places are fairly important. And so you really need to get that done. I think that's an issue that really needs to be, be dealt with. All right. I feel better. I hope you all feel better too. So for what's going on with the Colonial Pipeline, the Remain Calm Edition, I'm Sal Mercagliano. Please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. And most importantly, <laughs> can't say this enough, Remain Calm and only put fuel in authorized, regulated containers cars, gas cans, do not use Tupperware, do not use plastic bags, do not use big tote bins. Please, for your safety and everybody else, be smart out there. Thanks for watching.